I think we can maybe take uh, five minutes if I can. Yeah, okay. We have, we have an okay sign in the back to uh, open up the discussion. And uh, I would maybe uh, turn, my, turn to, um, turn to um, uh, Robert Ye first and uh, t tell you, like, have a, a scenario. You're being referred a patient who's young, extensive ischemia, completely asymptomatic, and he comes to you, and um, you, have to, you have to debate. And when you put him on a treadmill, he does like 12 mets, and he's got no, no, no symptoms. Uh, how do you deal with these patients who are young, you have an LED occlusion, but the, the physician is uncomfortable in leaving the LED occluded, but you have to make sort of, you have to convince yourself. How do you work that through? Yeah, I think, you know, my talk, I was a little dogmatic about it, and one of the last slides that I didn't get to because the, the, the catastrophe of the slide was, was the sort of exceptions. And, and I think there are obviously exceptions to these rules, uh, and you have to individualize care. So there are situations, you know, I think symptoms is the, is the most significant driver of what we do, but there are scenarios like this where you have large, huge, you know, large territories of ischemia, in young patients who, for whatever reason, don't have anginal warning signs. I mean, other scenarios are people who exercise. I've had patients of CTOs who exercise. They're asymptomatic, but they're athletes, and they arrested. They have a CTO, and their first sign of CTO or ischemia was their arrest, and they don't have any scar and MRIs. These are, these are alternative scenarios, which I think we have to weigh on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and they have to do with other factors, like the extent of ischemia and what, what we think the sort of downside of not doing it is. But it's hard. Um, but I think we do need to be careful, you know, about about making sure that we're always mindful of both the complications, the, the downside as well as the upside. No, that's a very good point. Jay, a question for you. If there is a uh, single trick you've learned, like when you review an angiogram, it's a, first of all, like, how much time do you spend in, in watching an angiogram? When you look, you know, you're being referred, and, and you know, you, we get outside angiogram being taken by colleagues, Lots of panning. It's very difficult. How, uh, so, how do you work through, and how? Do, uh, what's your What's your game plan? Well, I think I think ultimately what it comes down to is really taking the time, investing the time. Um, I often will review angiograms several times prior to the procedure, minimum of 20 minutes. Often with myself, sometimes with my partner, sometimes with a fellow. Always the morning of. It's it's time. You, you have to invest the time up front to have a plan. Yeah, Actually, that's what I've one, learned. Another yeah. quick comment is I think that sometimes people take lightly is take the time to review not the most recent angiogram, but go back mm -hmm. and look at the old angiograms and especially pre-cabbage angiograms. Oh, my God, they will give you revelations and give you clues of how to approach your case that you would never have had an idea about. Mm -hmm. Especially the post cabbage patient as well. You, you review the pre, but if they, they've, they've most of the time came like three, four, or five times, all those angiograms over time can can reveal a clarol that was not appearing, that that didn't happen to you, but it was present like on the previous cat. And I agree with you. It's very, it's a very good piece of advice. Take your time. Review that. So that's the reason why CTO PCI is not for ad hoc PC. It's not an ad hoc procedure. Sh you should take time to review. And Farouk, you uh, you talked. You taught us how to do step by step uh, retrograde. Is there something uh, you know the data on the complication? It bugs us. Is that, has it changed a bit your practice? Do you still uh, are you? Uh, has it decreased your threshold in going retrograde? It. It, clearly, the complication rate is higher in retrograde. So if there are equivocal options and I have an anti-grade approach, I will definitely choose to start with anti-grade. Even if I think the success of the anti-grade approach or dissection reentry approach may be low, even if I can safely apply that efficiently, I will do that first. Um, even in the case I showed that I uh, went retrograde, there was an ADR attempt to try to deliver a stingray balloon down there and try simply because I really do believe the risks are, and I think the evidence shows that, are much higher on the retrograde side. So, Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good point. Nick, I, I think uh, it cuts both ways, though. You know, I think the data is the data, but I feel like sometimes, you know, uh, in an attempt to avoid going retrograde, because you think that the perceived data suggests that the complications are 2x or 3x, 
you try to force an anti-grade case, and then you're struggling for three hours, you've created a big anti-grade dissection, distal visualization is bad, you've sheared off some branches, you can't re-enter, and I guarantee you that we don't check the troponins on those patients, I guarantee you they'll be higher or maybe even 2x or 3x higher than they would have been if you had been able to get through an invisible septal like you so elegantly showed. But some of the septals that you crossed were septals that you didn't even know exist, and we know they are crossable. So yeah. I feel like sometimes maybe a high-end epicardial increases your risk of perforation, but I still am not convinced that a safe septal surf with identifying potentially maybe an invisible septal is worse than a horrific single vessel runoff with shearing of a side branch going ADR. I think it's just you're pointing to the point that uh, to the fact that these are not obviously you you don't randomize to an, to anti-grade retrograde or ADR. The, the, there are factors leading to to do a case this way or the other way, and maybe the case that are labeled retrograde. Had they been done, integrate would have had a higher rate, complication rate. We don't have that answer, but it's may, maybe possible because there were reasons why we got we got retrograde in these cases. But the point is that it, the fact is that when you when you gear up retrograde, we have a bit of a higher procedure complication. When so, therefore, when we're we have some equipoise on the directionality of the treatment, I think it's common sense to 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 lean towards more and a great procedure. And we've had Nick today presenting a good experience, uh, good cases on ADR. What have you learned? What is the dip most difficult, like single stuff that you've learned through the process? You know, sometimes it's, uh, it shows beautifully. We select, this, we take the best cases to show the audience, but sometimes we, we had cases where they, they were like super tough. Like what have you learned to make this procedure you know, easier over time. What a, yeah. Wow. Um, th that's a big question. I think, you know, and, okay, let's and, move and, on. Bi and Bill, <laughs> and Bill uh, showed it well today is, and I still get stuck in this, is um, persisting in a mode of failure. And the thing about it is that because everybody that does these things is in general a skilled interventionalist, you know that if you can just get that wire one millimeter in a different direction, or if you can just get that catheter one millimeter further, you've got the case. So you sit there, I sit there, and persist doing that and doing that and doing that rather than saying, this ain't working. And, and it's, not, it's not me that's failing, it's the technique that isn't, that's, that's failing. And I mean, if you, if, you, if you build a house, you know, you're not gonna just use a hammer. You know, you're gonna use a lot of different tools to get that done. And the, the, the point is getting the procedure done yeah. and as efficiently and as quickly as you can. And I think, and that's why it's so imperative to know to, if you're gonna do that, I mean, Nick could not have done a better presentation on what it takes to really, really do this because I think each one of us up here um, has, you know, nobody's magic here. It, you know, none of these, you, you, nobody is an inherently a better interventional cardiologist who does CTOs. They've just practiced. They've just learned how to do it and they've committed themselves and they've put up with the failure and they've put up with the complications that are definitely a bit higher. And you, you, you have to make that clear to the patients, you know, what you're doing and that it is a little riskier than, than regular stuff. But I don't know, I'm, I'm waxing no, on and on. I think it's a lot of wisdom in your, in, your, in your comment. You were talking about tools. We have, uh, we have uh, Michael who has been uh, sort of new in the field of doing CTO-PCI. You have your uh, you have your toolbox now. You um, so tell us about the importance of the toolbox itself. Not what's in the, the what tool, but the box itself. Why is it important to keep those things in the box? I say to my colleague, it's because I want to keep 
matches away from children. Because I don't want a guy to say, let's give me this confianza up because I need support. No, I, I want to make sure that if you pick up something in that tool, in that toolbox, you know what you're looking at and you got to know what's in there. So what do you, what do you, do you teach people what's in that box or you, you take it only for you? What, what? No, no, I think, I think it's important, especially if you're in a teaching institution, to pass those tools along just like uh, they were passed to me by Manos. And, and, uh, and so becoming familiar with, with uh, the limits of your hands with those tools uh, and, and, uh, and then also at the same time pushing the envelope and learning uh, new uh, uh, toys uh, of the trade and, and um, uh, will, I think, increase your success moving forward. So... Yep. Yeah, very good. I would give my final word to uh, to Tony, my co-chair. So, is there anything we've not covered? Do you do you have any comment on uh, you'd like to share with the with, with, with the people here? No, I just think uh, there's so many things that we get all of us. Nick's uh, presentation on on going through the, the Nick uh, limbo, on going through the growing process. We have to be humble, and you got to realize you're going to fail, and you've got to keep coming to these meetings, like you mentioned. And you almost got to immerse yourself and get a lot of friends and know their phone numbers and be willing to go somewhere and watch them and be willing to be a student again. But it's, it is a lot of fun uh, for a lot of reasons once, once you kind of get going on it. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, panel. Thank you for the audience. Let's see you tomorrow.